time. Very good. Just grab a seat. Lots of seats to be had. Um, again, welcome to everybody. I'm, I'm looking at some names and uh, there's quite, there's a few people, a couple people I think that I have not heard, uh, heard of before or seen. Um, so welcome again to the Science Circle presentation. And let's get uh, Going. Now, oh, by the way, uh, different talkers or different presenters like to do things different ways. For me, I love to see the chat because I'm reading the chat as I'm presenting. I mean, I know what I'm presenting. Yeah, especially all non-humans. Are... <laughs> I haven't looked at the audience. In fact, I'm sitting because I don't want to uh, complicate things by having to mess with uh, my avatar and the chat and the slides and the whole bit. I'd rather concentrate on the uh, chat. And the, uh, yeah, and, <laughs> wow, one is sitting, so I don't have to worry about the avatars. So I don't know if we do have any non-human avatars in the audience. I doubt we have any non-human people behind the avatars, but if you're a non-human avatar, welcome, welcome, as well as human avatars, etc. Okay, yeah, good. Okay, so let's, so the talk today, the presentation, the something that I would share, like to share with you, is a non-human language, which, as Syzygy asked, it's not computers, it's not G chat GPT, this is about living organisms that have language. Um, the guess who's talking now is a reference to an old movie, by the way. Okay, so what will we look, take a look at today is, well, exactly, um, do dogs have language? <laughs> I love that uh, cartoon. That was around 1995. I have a copy of it. And uh, it's just great uh, when people started looking at um, who could be on the Internet. And, you know, that's really one of the things that attracts me to Second Life is you don't, you can be anyone. There's no, there's few social barriers here. It's just how you interact with people, both in language, uh, uh, body language, uh, in some cases, uh, in chat, in uh, voice, like I'm doing now. Uh, there's lots of ways that we do that, and yet um, you can be anyone. And if you're a dog, welcome to the uh, presentation as well. Okay, so the presentation today, I'm going to try to address uh, quickly, kind of, you know, what's communication, what's language, and then a little more in depth, how are we able to speak? When I say we, I'm talking about uh, humans. When did we, but also animals. Um, when did we, excuse me, when did we start speaking? What distinguishes human from non-human language, if there are distinctions? And then especially what living things have language besides humans? Uh, I don't pretend to be a linguist or a physiologist or whatever. So this is not a, comprehensive treatment, but more um, an awareness of some of the issues and the subject, which I found, I saw, it. what inspired me was in December, there's an article that came out by a science uh, educator, in other words, someone, uh, we, we need both, um, <laughs> yeah, okay, so we need both science, but we also need then people who are good at presenting science to everyone. Otherwise, it would be just a small little clique somewhere uh, or, or academics that, you know, talk to each other. So uh, it's very important. Okay. Um, so anyway, let's uh, continue. Well, you're right. I actually met Carl Sagan once back in 1970, sometimes that time period. Um, or, um, darn it, uh, I'm, I'm trying to remember the name of the, of, uh, there's, there's several prominent uh, people today who are really good at, um, he got his autograph. Okay, cool. Yeah, there, Neil deGrasse Tyson. That's the one that I was thinking about. Um, okay, so what is language? What's communication? Let's take a look at this. Yeah, show off. <laughs> That's okay. I, I, I said that I met Carl Sagan, so. That's good. 
Um, okay, so communication. And, okay. Um, yeah, okay, caveats is one of the, I'm going to do two things which are usually a no-no for presentations. One is I'm going to do a, a slight uh, explanation or apology. They say you should never apologize when you're talking. Just go ahead and talk. Um, and, but you'll notice a little difference in my presentation and in some of the other presentations. So I need to at least explain. And that is like in this, you should apologize for apologizing. Okay. Well, anyway, yeah, this week, last week, whatever this year, month uh, has been bizarre. And just about everything that could go wrong went wrong. But I learned back in the Navy that uh, long, long ago uh, that sometimes you just have to get something done. So I have a presentation for you. It has all kinds of good information in it, but it's not nearly as rich in pictures as some of you have been grown to uh, or be accustomed to uh, my presentations in the past. So that's my explanation without necessarily apologizing because I am here and, I, and there's some ma marvelous information in so the other thing is because there's not a, as many pictures, is that it's a little too, yeah, use your imagination. Yeah, just talk. Okay. LOL. Okay. So the other thing is that I'm going to uh, sometimes kind of read what's on the slides because it's a little rich in, in words. Um, and if your first language is in English, I want, you, uh, I want to make sure that you... Yeah, spray me. <laughs> okay, so what is communication? Well, communication is uh, used to advantage the species to help them to uh, continue, to develop, to grow. And that basically, really laughing. <laughs> okay, so um, they also exchange information. That doesn't necessarily mean they aren't one way sometimes, uh, but they, they, they convey, they exchange information. Okay, so language, though, Interestingly enough, uh, it's hard to say, okay, what's human, what's non-human language because, or how they're complete, or how they're the same, because there's no accepted definition or criteria. <laughs> so, but there is some structure and such. So let's, let's uh, continue along that vein. In other words, the topic is difficult to um, completely convey. Okay, so let's take a look at then how we... Uh, learn how to speak. Um, well, we are, you know, tagline is that, or tag is, uh, we are dependent on at least some sort of symbolic sign language. But remember that, you know, there's been people like um, uh, uh, Helen Keller who couldn't uh, hear or see. Um, there's been animals uh, don't just, in other words, animals use a lot more than visual and uh, other things, but it's all symbolic. Uh, but, you know, emotional response. In fact, that's how we sometimes get miscommunication in just chat, because there isn't the full, <laughs> yeah, depending on, uh, well, you know, there's curse words in every language. Um, so, in any case, how did we evolve? Well, yeah, I know, damn it. <laughs> okay, so, um, one of the uh, one of the things that, it, that linguists or physiologists might say is, well, you know, humans have what's called a descended larynx, that it's it's lower in the throat than other animals, and so they were saying, well, that's why humans can speak and other animals can't. In other words, they can you, your the back of your tongue can move more and is more. The the problem is that it also is why we choke on food, and an animal like a dog since somebody mentioned dogs, can wolf down uh, food uh, because they don't have that problem. But when dogs bark, they found that by looking at uh, the, under x-ray or whatever that their larynx lowers, and also red deer and others have a descended larynx when they make voices. So we can't use that argument for saying, well, that's why humans are special. The other thing is that around uh, 20 years ago, uh, they just... Yeah, there you go. Tag uh, will give you a much uh, better. Uh, I, I don't pretend to be a doctor like Tag is, so. Um, 
I, I appreciate anyone in the audience who may be a uh, physiologist or a, a linguist or whatever, to, which is one of the reasons also why I like the sci love the science circle. Uh, really? I didn't know what that was. Okay, that's cool. Yeah. <laughs> well, we all have the imposter um, syndrome sometimes. Uh, right, me right now. Okay, so humans also, they discovered, uh, yeah, uh, discovered about 20 years ago that humans have this gene that what they did was they found uh, there's some humans with a variation that could not speak. And they said they found out that they didn't have the FOX2 or P2 gene and people that could speak did. And so they go, oh, yeah, okay. So that's why humans are unique because animals don't have this. Well, they looked a little closer and they found out, well, you know, primitive humans like Neanderthals had it, rodents, birds, that tells fishes. In other words, who are the non-speaking humans? <laughs> well, uh, okay, there really were a couple people in the UK who had, who could not speak. In other words, they had a genetic disability. It's called, there's a name for it. I, I wrote it down in my notes. Uh, tag, you know what it's called? Um, but there's a medical name for it. And no, it's not autism. It's okay, but there is a two word uh, thing for, you know, not being able to speak. Okay, so anyway, uh, let me go on to the next one. Here is okay. Then, then we said, and then they, um, said, okay, well, you know, human brains are different, so that they can support thinking and language. But then they found, well, you know, in birds, <laughs> actually the same genes, uh, yeah, 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 I, I think that's it, uh, like verbal dysphagia or something to that effect. Vocal dysphagia, this loss of words, very clever. Okay, <laughs> that's also one of the reasons I like attending these ones, it is because you guys are very clever. Okay, with your language. Okay, so they found that the genes that were associated, yeah, would be more specific. Okay, so they found that the genes that were associated with neural circuitry that supports language and such is also in birds. <laughs> so we could, and that thought and language are separate parts of the brain. So we, so now, okay, now we couldn't say, well, you know, humans, uh, brains are different. Well, not necessarily, not in this area. Um, okay, so when did we learn to speak? Well, the initial viewpoints were that it either came on suddenly, which was another argument for, well, you know, only modern humans have it, or it evolved. And the current idea is that um, it evolved. And here's kind of the, uh, from one um, article I saw, this is kind of the way it evolved. So if you uh, talk to Lucy back long ago, um, uh, Australopithecus afarensis, uh, she would have been as vocal as a chimpanzee. Uh, later on, like with Homo erectus, the first uh, uh, humans um, that um, traveled the globe, essentially, they had symbolic language and stuff. And by the time you get up to uh, Cro-Magnet, etc., yeah, I like it too. I thought it was cool. And so speech sounds particularly like quick languages the, now how do you pronounce it it's it's um how do you pronounce this Kroy san the people that live in southwest um, africa no it's more like the click and i can't do it i was going to try to do it but if anybody can do a click language like some like they found like they find in uh southwest south africa uh some of the peoples there could do have click languages in any case click languages developed perhaps uh, 70,000 years ago, and then you had consonant values, 50, and then the full range of speech that we have today is only, yeah, exactly, that's who the people I'm talking about uh, in Kalahari. Um, uh, Khoisan is either language or the people. Okay, so human speech in those is only 20,000 um, years old. It's like, oh my goodness. Okay, so they, Yes, okay, now there, see, I, I put that down there uh, for sumo. It may be, in other words, if you have a stroke, it may be affecting that area. Tag, I'm, I'm counting on you to <laughs> help me out here. Okay, so there are multiple systems involved. There's both physiology, cognition, in other words, uh, thinking, ideas, etc., and then psychology, 
uh, and socialism and stuff like that. And hum humans are able to integrate all of those. But, you know, birds can have, uh, they control their song in the left hemisphere. And this is much the same in mammals, although not quite so um, unilaterally. But in the humans, they have two areas, which up on the slide there, I don't need to, plus I can't pronounce them, but <laughs> uh, ooh, there you go. So they're, they're, they're decorated with, yeah, okay, they're, they're, they're from, okay, cool, okay. Uh, please pay attention to the chat uh, when able. Uh, there's always some really cool stuff there. But anyway, things like laughter, like I was doing, or screams, which I, I, I would do if this didn't work, or animal calls are all in the same part of the brain, by the way, which is a, a little more uh, primitive area. Okay, so now singing predates language. And so early singing may have imitated nature. Uh, it's been part of uh, earliest social or human culture. Um, singing was well developed. Um, yeah, birds sing, the bees sing, even da 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 da. Let's okay, etc. Okay, so in any case, uh, it's been part of socialization and religion and entertainment for let's not. <laughs> yeah, really. Um, wolves. There you go. In E major series. Okay, what about little wolves? Do they do the same uh, key? Okay, so some believe that it takes domestication. So humans are essentially domesticated primates. So you've got domesticated wolves, birds, more vocal, etc. Cetera, et cetera. E minor for little wolves. Okay. Uh -huh. Okay, so those are some of the... The other thing is that they've looked at birds and humans, and they learn bird songs or language uh, much the same way. In other words, they babble at first. If you've had kids or been around kids, they babble. Then they produce a lot of sounds, not, a, not all of which have meaning. And then they tend to kind of focus on sounds that have meaning. And they learn from their elders. And there appears to be a, a time period that if you're going to be multilingual, that's the best time to learn. In other words, what, around two years or whatever? Who's a child development psychologist in here? Okay, and then, um, so it's not just humans that develop language like that. And the other thing, by the way, is if language were purely instinctual, you wouldn't have that thing about development or, or learning from elders or dialects or anything else. They, 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 everybody everywhere, you know, a bird or whatever, would have the same songs, etc., etc. Okay, so how is human language unique? If so... How might it be unique? Let's take a look. Okay. Uh, the idea of being able to speak to the animals, speak to the animals, da, 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 okay, um, has been around a long time. You know, there's, there's this legend of King Solomon's ring that enabled the wearer to uh, talk with animals and birds and such. Uh, people turning into animals so that they could understand. <laughs> now I know. And then Dr. Doolittle. Uh, books, which have been movies, etc. Uh, so there's there's that. Yeah, well, you know, yeah, lots of folklore of, of things going on on at unusual times or at the unusual circumstances and stuff. But one of the thing, one of the reasons we may not be as far forward on some of the scientific areas is because uh, philosophers, religion, religious. Um, authority, etc., basically did their darndest to say to try to make humans unique and not like animals. But if you look up on the screen there, the when Rene Descartes said, I think, therefore I am, it was more than just a trite statement. It was basically saying, I am, I'm real because I think I'm a human. Animals are not, animals are not even real, they simply are automatons. They, they, they may have the mechanisms, but they behave uh, purely instinctually. They're not humans. We humans are superior. Okay, and then this linguistic society in Paris went so far as to ban even talking about non-human language. So it, we had to overcome those uh, human prejudice. Well, <laughs> For sure, uh, Max. 
but we had to kind of overcome that those uh, uh, human prejudices to uh, be able to even get around <laughs> to uh, exploring the topic. Now, I'm not, I'm not going to read all of this, but the idea is this is a lot of the other types of things that we thought about um, as far as uh, language and humans and stuff like that. Uh, the bottom one is kind of cute. It basically says, okay, great. So you got some animals that can uh, say, you know, watch out for the hawk or something, but they can't sit down over a cup of coffee and talk about the hawk, you know? Um, <laughs> so, uh, in other words, people have continued to try to figure out um, how humans are different. Well, yeah, I'd have to go back to there, but you're, you're right. Okay, so B.F. Skinner, though, uh, who, uh, which, which was, um, which was the, oh, was it, I guess it's Pavlov, the dog, Pavlov's dog thing, or whatever, in other words, the uh, conditioning one, he basically said, look, any, you can teach any animal that was uh, sufficient conditioning, which is almost true if you think of parrots and dogs and stuff a little bit. Dogs may go woof woof or try to speak, parrots can speak English words. Okay, but linguists, boy, they didn't really, they really didn't like that one. And then they were done, and then I, I really, I'm not going to go over all of these, because I want to uh, skip to the really good part, which is the, yeah, the bell thing. Okay, I want to skip to the really good uh, part about what they found about animals that do have language. Okay, so you can read some of these ones here. Uh, here here's a whole bunch of them going, uh, okay, so some animals have language, but... They don't have all of these. Um, okay, that's nice. <laughs> but, you know, actually, in other words, they discounted chemical languages and they discounted, like, stunt sort of thing, and they discounted a whole bunch of stuff. So it was becoming really harder to go, uh, human language is unique. Um, yeah, and my dogs definitely have me trained. Um, okay, and here's some more. And if you look at them, um, apes do some of these, bees do some of these, and cats, definitely. Cats have the dog strain, too. Okay. So now let's get to the uh, uh, juicy point part of the presentation. I'm watching my time here. And what living things have language besides humans? Ah, okay. Yeah, bees dance. Bee dances and stuff. Okay. So, um, which, what animals do you think have languages? I'm going to see who's awake in the audience. Well, Orange, I would agree with you on that. Uh, but what are the ones, yeah, okay, whale songs that go across the ocean, like, like in Dory, like, whale songs. Okay, um, parrots uh, and other birds. Uh, birds talk among themselves. Chimps, yeah, different cults sing it. Well, I kind of like. I thought that was funny. In, in, um, <laughs> yeah, Finding Nemo and, and uh, Dory sort of thing. Let's see. It's it's it, it's kind of a uh, interesting parody where Dory thought that that was what whales <laughs> sounded like. It's kind of like the people who, uh, if you're talking to somebody who, who English isn't their first language, and then you slow. Not slow down, but you talk louder so that they can understand. You know, it's just um, people aren't thinking sometimes or, or as much. Okay. Uh, oh, trees, trees. Sumo, uh, remember to say trees when we come to the plant one. Uh, because they found that plants communicate in another way, which I'm going to share with you here. Okay. So lot, oh, grass, I don't know. Does grass communicate? Good. Okay. So uh, I did... The reason why I was here, like, within about 10 minutes of the uh, presentation was I threw in some pictures here so that um, I could, so that if you're not familiar with some of the animals or whatever, the fungus control, oh, on The, the Last of Us, I wanted to get that game. That, that's a, a game as well as a movie. Okay, fungus. Now, uh, Orange, uh, get with um, Sumo there about when, when we say trees, because fungus has a very important... Uh, role to play in tree communication. Okay, so what did we have back here? We had uh, previous. Okay, we have uh, birds like parrots, dolphins, uh, chimpanzees, fungus, compulgus. 
Okay. Um, if English isn't your first language, you might miss some of the jokes in chat. I know. <laughs> but, um, okay, so what kind of experiments have they done? Is that now, remember, this is not a totally inclusive presentation. We only have an hour. I wanted to show you some of the things which I thought was rather fascinating and that uh, have been more recent. Um, so dolphins, they have found that, you know, they could, hey, um, Tag, would you happen to know there's a name for the nose of the dolphin? It's not a nose. It's called something else. You might not be a animal phys... Eh, not a beak. There's another name. Um, but in any case, you might not be an animal physiologist or comparative physiologist, whatever. But there's a name for the nose of the dolphin. Um, yeah, okay, but don't miss anything. Okay, so anyway, dolphins... I would have said snout, too, but there's another name for it. Okay, so anyway, dolphins can... Uh, I, another name... Well, it could be, but I think there's another name. Okay, so anyway, they can press a keyboard that generates whistles uh, for rewards. Well, okay, that's nice, but what was fascinating was when the humans went away and they were still um, recording what was going on in the uh, dolphin habitat, is the dolphins decided to kind of play a game and the, okay, rostrum, okay. Um, but in any case, the dolphins decided to kind of play with the whistles that the humans, now remember this is humans make up a whistle that might mean ball. And so when the humans were away, the dolphins were actually making the sound for the ball when they were playing with each other with the ball. <laughs> so that, to me, that was kind of a uh, <laughs> something very unusual that the dolphins were doing because they weren't just pleasing the humans. They were like, okay, if the humans want to call this a ball, um, we'll call it a ball. Okay, great. And then the, the, once they showed what a telephone was like, they had an underwater telephone, and the mother dolphin was using the telephone to speak to its baby. And the baby not only knew that it was the mother, but knew what to do. So, you know, don't think that um, only if they get to the service. Okay. Um, so anyway, the other thing is that there's an artificial language that has lexigrams, that is, symbols that represent uh, objects or ideas. And there's a... It, they make up a language called Yerkish, which is uh, based on the guy uh, name who founded the um, laboratory where they were doing this. But they not only were able to learn these symbols and then equate them to ide both ideas and objects, but they also then combined them in ways that they were not taught. You know, like um, uh, banana door or you know, or uh, say I'm not as smart as a primate, so I, I'd have to find out uh, how they combined them. But whatever, they combined them in ways that uh, they were not taught. And then, of course, parrots can uh, speak in English. It, but parrots, you got to be careful there because it's just like little kids. If you swear a lot at home, somebody's talking about swear words. If you swear a lot at home, don't be surprised if the first word that your kid uses at school is a swear word. <laughs> you know? Um, same thing with parrots. Uh, so you have to be careful. Yeah, there you go. Like cry, hurt, water, or radish, some things like that, which to me tells me a lot about uh, their cog cognitive uh, abilities. I mean, that's amazing. Okay, so anyway, now here's some really cool things. I'm, I'm going to uh, give you some um, ones that I found that were the most interesting. Is. Uh, Yerkish, <laughs> very clever tag, Yerkish, Yiddish, etc. Okay. Um, okay, now what they did was they, they, they recorded gestures that apes used in the wild. And there were lots of them, um, upwards of 80, 90, whatever. And then they uh, recorded gestures that one to two year olds use, children. And the children, now this is what I find absolutely astounding, is the children and the apes used about 50 gestures that were in common. 
both, and then they used them both singly and in sequences, like what Sis was just talking about, like, you know, high hurt water sort of thing. Um, and then adults also were able to guess what they meant. Now, some of them, like extending your hands might mean I want, or putting your hand up to your mouth might mean I want to eat. In other words, some of them, we could go, well, that's obvious, but it's not so obvious if you think that apes also use those time languages. Uh, so I thought that was uh, extremely interesting. The other thing is it doesn't matter what the language is. It could be code language, it could be colors, it could be sounds, uh, whatever, is that um, in both apes and humans, they pass the language code to each other. In other words, they taught each other. They develop patterns. They use it to communicate. So, in other words, don't you know? Be surprised that uh, 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 high. I, I well, I use the term higher order. Uh, I know embarrassing for creationists, um, etc. Okay, so elephants, and that's just a very pretty fish that I decided to put up there. May not be the, the fish, but it's a very pretty fish. Okay, so. Doing experiments in the lab is not probably the best way to um, see how animals communicate. That is like, well, I don't want to communicate with humans. They're pretty primitive. Um, uh, so observing in the wild, the problem about observing in the wild is that it takes a long time. I mean, you know, Jane Goodall, I think, what did it take? Uh, anyone here, an uh, animal... Um, uh, well, well, anthropologists, not anthropologists, but uh, yeah, okay, there, elephants, really? Okay, well, now, serious, hang on to that, because uh, it works the same way for um, whales or dolphins and then fish. In other words, if the uh, orca or whatever talks about, let's go hunting, and you play that same sound to herrings, uh, they'll scatter, because they, they, they associate that with hunting behavior. Yeah, very cool. Okay, the other thing, but field work takes a long time. I forget how many, how long Jane Goodall was in the uh, jungle before the chimpanzees uh, trusted her. Um, I'd have to go back. Yeah, uh, yeah, a long time before the, uh, she could get some of the observations. So elephants make a lot of sounds. Uh, fish have clip languages. Um, yes, indeed. Okay, so let's talk about some of these other ones. Uh, the whales, like we just talked about, sea turtles. Um, the one on the far right is a coral larvae. And then, of course, you've got sea lions, pinnipeds. They're um, below. So let's take a look. Okay, well, whales, we know that whales have some cool uh, whale songs. Uh, they, now, we know their language. They repeat the so sounds at varying frequencies. Uh, they, and oh, the whales are the ones that they go, okay, there's about a five or ten second feeding call um, that they probably, you know, they, uh, they hunt cooperatively. They probably go, okay, you guys go around in that circle and I'll go around in this circle and we'll uh, herd them into this area or whatever. I think that's about five or ten seconds. Okay, and so if you play those feeding calls back to fish, the fish will scatter. Because they, uh, and not other whale songs, but th that particular type of uh, feeding song, the official scatter because they know it's associated with whales hunting them. Now, okay, now this is cool. This one's really cool. Okay, why, and it's already up there, I should have asked. Why do you think that little turtles, sea turtles, that, you know, they come ashore, they lay the eggs, why do you think they all hatch at the same time and go out to sea? That's the, uh, Anyone want to read off the, the middle one? <laughs> is that they have found, now this is cool, they found that, the, that the, they actually communicate with each other in the eggs so that they all coordinate the time of their birth. You know what they used to think? They used to think, uh, I know where I used to live, live there were these um, little fishies that came ashore only, you know, in the full moon or some other thing like that. Uh, but they found, uh, and they used to think something like that, in other words, something that's more instinctual, but they actually find they coordinate the timing of their birth so that they can swarm and so more than make it to the sea without being picked off by birds and stuff. Isn't that cool? Yeah, exactly. 
It, that's that's exactly right. That is most cool. Um, I don't know what they, you know, oh, well, you're right. Now, motors, uh, uh, noise of perhaps, um, who knows, noise of boats, uh, any number of things. Yeah, that would be. Okay, so you got sea lions also that are able to understand it. Now, here's another one that I think that's really cool is that coral larvae, you wouldn't think of this as a sophisticated animal. But they can actually, if you play them the sound, whatever the sound of a healthy reef, reef is versus one that's not healthy, they'll actually go toward or colonize the healthy reef rather than the unhealthy one. Now, that is, you know, some of those are cool. Yeah, there you go. The ha hatching dance. Do, do, do. Okay, so now let's take a look at some of the other. Um... By the way, uh, if anyone knows of other... Um, examples that I haven't put up, please share. Let me see what I've got. I've got a number of other ones here. I'm just uh, seeing what we've got left, time-wise. Okay, so I know how fast to uh, work through these. Oh, we got plenty. Okay, so anyway, um, here we got parrots, prairie dogs, um, Primates like orangutans, or orangutans. Um, man of the forest is, I think, what um, orangutan means. Um, mice and the plant. And the plant has a little sign on it saying, help me. And there's a reason for that, So, which I think is just most cool when they're talking about plants. Okay, so birds, we kind of all know, uh, because they've been experimenting with birds for some time, and you can put a bird in a cage. I wouldn't call it domesticated, but you put a bird in a cage and you can observe it and stuff. But birds, of course, can mimic human language. Not just human language, they can mimic sounds. I know. Uh, I've seen birds in the back of our yard mimic, mimic some of the sounds of, uh, that they hear around the neighborhood, which, is, which I think is most cool. Um, they can answer simple questions sometimes, like, you know, what's the meaning of life? I have no idea if birds would say 42 or something else. Um, so, okay, now there you go. That's, uh, if you have seen stuff, so Chantel says she was sitting in the garden and suddenly heard a rooster crowing and there wasn't uh, a rooster and it was a blackbird. Um, learning rooster language, I'm sure, okay? Because um, birds can... Oh, I like the fly. Um, that was a weird movie. Oh, yeah, the, the fly, or, or and then the spider was about to eat the fly. And it, help me, help me! And like that, so, okay. So anyway, uh, bird songs are very complex. They uh, have rhythm, I know. <laughs> Well, I'm doing that so that everybody will groan and um, your chainsaw sound, yeah. Uh, tonal patterns, rhythm, pitch, and in other words, it's not just simple, mindless songs. They sometimes combine them in different ways. In other words, songs for different threats, uh, to make me new meaning, if, uh, like, we adopt words. Uh, they're also multilingual, like the uh, blackbird that uh, Chantel mentioned. Uh, oh, yeah, there's some birds in Australia that are cool. Are you talking kookaburras or which ones that are? This, or the, um, the, I know there's some budgies and stuff. Yeah, that do that. Um, and then birds are multilingual if they learn it at a particular age. Puffins, really? Um, meaning of life. Okay, yeah, I'm going to have to go back and take a look at some of these um, uh, links and chats. I can do it when somebody else is talking, but I can't look at a YouTube video at the same time I, I'm talking or chatting. Okay, so prairie dogs. Now, this is cool. This is cool. I like this one. Okay. Uh, the article said that prairie dogs have the most sophisticated vocal language ever decoded. Better than chimps, dolphins, or orcas. Like, it's what? Okay, so what they found, does anyone know what a prairie dog, or I mean, you may not have seen a prairie dog because they're not in um, too many places, but they have them quite a bit in the uh, middle of the United States and stuff. Are there prairie dogs other places? 
I would imagine they live in colonies. Yeah, okay, all the time in zoos. Uh, in New York, really? Okay, wow, the zoo is in New York. Okay, but they're called prairie dogs because they probably live in the prairie. <laughs> okay, so um, you know all about prairie dogs? Cool. Merle, tell me about this. Is that uh, what they found? Yeah, the mount. okay. Is that what they found is that they not only have calls for going like, oh, no, there's a coyote, but the calls can also describe the type of behavior they need to escape uh, from the predators. They can also determine a species of predator and give a call for a species of predator um, that also says, okay, it's not just coyote. It's like there's a young coyote that's uh, mostly uh, dark color on its face that is not moving terribly fast, and I recommend going to the right, you know, something to that effect. In other words, very um, sophisticated type of calls. And they can also, they found that if they have, like, say, a triangle, and they pop, uh, uh, observer, if they have a triangle and they pop it up, that the, that the um, prairie dogs can make up a new call for, oh, there's a triangle over to the left. I have no idea whether it's um, bad or not, but we haven't seen around here, so. <laughs> in other words, that kind of stuff. Now, has anyone seen on a prairie dog whether they, they, they're in their burrow and they stand on their hind legs, put their arms out and go, they, they jump, it's what I call a jump yip. It's like, yip, like that. Okay, they, what they found is that it's not just uh, a prairie dog ex ex exclaiming something. Uh, what they found is that it's kind of like a wave in a stadium. In other words, when they're going to go forage, or they're going to go farther from their hole to get something, is that they're basically trying to make sure that the whole little prairie dog town is alert. And so, like a wave in a stadium, if you're not alert that there's a wave happening, you might miss it. So when one little prairie dog goes, and jumps like that, it's expecting that other prairie dogs in different, you know, on the edges and stuff will also do the same thing. So it's like a, it's a uh, test for alertness. It's like, you know, uh, stop eating and, and pass the word. Exactly. Um, okay, mice. This is cool, too. Uh, there's lots of cool ones. I've left the cool ones for later, I think. Is that mice sing. Okay. The reason we can't hear it is because it's at a higher uh, frequency. But uh, they sing like birds. Uh, it, in other words, if you slow down the, their song, it sounds like bird songs. Uh, they have uh, whistles. Um, and they know that they learn these because of deaf, and they have to hear. Because here again, if you deafen a mouse, you know, ah, that's statistic, but we do a lot with mice is, you know, you deafen the mouse, and then their songs degrade. And so their tunes are dependent on hearing and stuff, which, of course, again, would not be, um, would not happen if it were purely instinct. In other words, hearing wouldn't be a, a problem. Now, anyone seen the, uh, uh, cart, the movie Babe <laughs> with the pig? Um, in, what was it, 95, 1995, something like that? Well, it's one of my favorite movies. Whatever. Is that there's the little mice in there go, you know, doo -doo, doo -doo, doo -doo, you know, some sort of little song uh, in in the movie, which I think is just cute. Okay, so anyway, um, yeah, I know. Okay, so in any case, for mice, their songs vary in syllable types. They require feedback uh, to learn them. Males alter the pitch. So instead of a mouse going, doo -doo, if, if, a, if a female comes along and is like, oh, do the woo, yeah, I, uh, I'm really uh, interested in you, um, that sort of thing. So it's, it's, they found that mice are a lot more, um, <laughs> uh, can communicate. Now, plant, plant communications. This is another really cool one that I found uh, that you may not know. Now, we, we probably know that if you have studied it a bit, plant communications what they're able to do is chemically, yeah, I'm not quite in the time. Um, so, <laughs> well, yeah, don't, don't try this because you might 
um, you might attract mice. <laughs> so then, unless you're the Pied Piper, you you, you might not uh, want to uh, imitate uh, mice calls. Um, okay, so we know that plants, like trees, earlier. Okay, a couple people have said about trees and uh, mushrooms or fungi. We know that there are mycelial networks. The um, these little white tendrils that if you dig into really rich soil that's near trees and stuff, you'll see them. And they act as a network, much the same as a computer network, so to speak, but it's in chemical. So trees can actually uh, talk to each other. The mother trees talk to the smaller trees. They, I mean, it's, it's very, very uh, a complicated kind of conversation. But they have also found that plants can detect running the sound of running water. So in other words, if you record the sound of running water and you play it in a particular, and you're over in one direction, the plants will actually grow toward that sound. And that plants, now I find this one the really eerie one because I trimmed a couple of trees the other day. And it's like plants emit a high pitched click. It's at, uh, it's at 40,000 kilohertz to 80,000, where we kind of max out at 16 to 20 kilohertz. And so when they're stressed by drought or infection or cuts, like an insect's eating them or people are cutting them, they'll actually make a sound that's almost as loud as human voice. And they don't do it when they're not stressed. Now, I actually found this in the... Uh, magazine Biz Business Insider, because they're talking about being able to use this as an agricultural tool to know when their plants are stressed, when they need uh, water or chemicals or, you know, I'm being eaten by insects or stuff like that. Wouldn't that be cool? Um, oh, okay. Um, Meryl, if you, have, if you have some other stuff to add about uh, some of these, uh, let me know. Or anyone else that has this. Okay, eight communications. Um, let's see, I'm watching the time here. Well, yeah, in other words, there's um, uh, a cactus versus another type. In fact, I've got African violets right now and, and some uh, Christmas cactuses in my bathroom because it's too cold outside, and uh, they all, they basically need different water needs and such. Um, oh, for, okay, just made friends with, okay, cool, good. Uh, they look like cute little things to be friends with. Okay, so anyway, ape communications. We also know that um, apes uh, have uh, advanced language or communication abilities, and they can take turns, uh, sequence sounds, and uh, they... Orangutans, I like that one at the bottom, where they use leaves in front of their mouths to lower the frequency of the... Well, we don't know, because jokes tend to be cultural, right? So they could be telling a joke about humans, and a human won't get it, because they are not an orangutan. <laughs> um, so, but we all know a lot of things about that, you know, here, great gossips, probably. Okay, so speaking of orangutans, uh, there are also... Um, other ways that that are non-vocal communications. Uh, well, cats probably joke a lot, uh, especially at humans' expense, I would imagine. Okay, so orangutans, bees, that's the little bee bats there in the middle, uh, bats. Um, and what did I put over on the other side there? Uh, I may have put the wrong one. But whatever, let's, go, let's uh, continue here. So, okay. So, um, we know that e humans also use non-vocal or, or non-verbal or whatever communications. In other words, if we simply write in chat, you're missing maybe 80% of the language. So that uh, body language, facial expressions, um, position, I mean, there's uh, lots of stuff that uh, sometimes clothing, um, shifting e uneasily in your seat, uh, all of those are communication which cannot be conveyed simply by voice or by chat. 
uh, primates, for example, um, use olfactory, uh, auditory, but in other words, hearing, touching, visual, in other words, all the different kinds of senses the same way we do um, that convey meaning. Okay, mice running and <laughs> well, that's a, that could very well be. Uh, I don't know if Sizzle will go, E can stand on a chair though. But. Okay, so then B dances, uh, they, if you're unfamiliar with that, they are able to, they go back to the hive, and then they try to get people's attention, and then they communicate the direction and distance to a food source, like uh, nectar, and they also, if they're looking for a new hive area, several bees will go out in different uh, directions, uh, they'll come back and they'll go, look, I think I found a, a good place over here, um, and the other guys, well, you know, this is a better place over here, and then if the, they find a new place and then find a uh, uh, set up a new hive. And they also learn the dance and such from older bees because younger bees are less consistent or accurate than older bees. And without older bees, they don't have that uh, thing. So they know that that... Now, bats are interesting. They have about 33 different sounds or syllables. Now, are those just for echolocation? In other words, like pixels, they, they create a pictograph of where the food is and not to run into the cave and stuff in their brain, or are they conveying words and ideas? Well, we don't know that yet. Okay. Squids also do something interesting, is that a squid um, can communicate in color, shape, texture changes, which they control. The, Remember that one of the criteria for language is to be able to volunteer. It's called volative. Uh, volative? Um, volun uh, they, in other words, it's not... And one of the other criteria is that vol volitional. Good, thank you. <laughs> Volition. That's what I was looking for, was the word volition. Um, so one of the reef squ squids, they... Now, can, can we do this? I think we can. But one of the reef squids they saw actually giving a message to a squid on one side of it in color, you know, by changing colors, and then another type of message uh, to a squid on the other side. It's like, wow, okay, but we can do the same thing. In other words, if you're in a group of friends and you're talking to someone else, you can actually uh, convey a message, obviously, to someone else in the group. Um, Two-faced squid. Well, there you go. But let's say, for example, that you've got two women and a guy, uh, and the guy's talking to one of the women, and one of the women might be conveying to the other woman, like, this guy's really boring, let's get out of here, you know, pretend that you've got a call from a friend, um, <laughs> and can be conveying that message with nonverbal language as the guy's speaking, you know, that sort of thing. Uh, which, so humans also spend, um, uh, can do that. Okay, so in conclusion here is that it's becoming more difficult to pretend that, now that, that may be biased on my part, but it's becoming more difficult to pretend that other things do not have language, for one, and then, or think, because if, if animals can do these types of things, what cognitive ability do they have? It's certainly not just instinctual. Um, some of these may be my opinion here, but other languages do not have to contain all the features of human language. In other words, like we 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 have tend to be a binary going. Okay, they only really have language if it meets all these seven criteria. Well, maybe they don't need to <laughs> to meet all these uh, seven criteria. Uh, and if you, if you thought about a squid who can change color and change texture and uh, do it out both, do different things out both two sides, or a bat that can echolocate and such, they, they might think of human language as primitive. So I, yeah, I wouldn't be too, uh, yeah, okay, uh, I wouldn't be too quick to go like, wow, human language is 
uh, by far uh, superior to anything else. Well, no, I don't think it is. Okay, myself. Okay. So I think we should kind of expand our definition of language to include the richness that we... Uh, <laughs> okay. Um, and that's why I try to wrap up within an hour. This is my uh, second to last slide, or maybe my last slide, uh, to the kind of richness that we see um, in nature. And now the one other thing that I might say is that the more we think that we're different from nature, the more likely we are to, and this is kind of my parting thought, is the more likely we are to think of nature as just something we can exploit instead of something we're part of. In other words, we're, we're, we're part of this thing. And so uh, it behooves us to understand our place in nature, not just exploit it because for somehow we're, you know, uh, superior. Okay, so that's my presentation. We have...